Hello everybody. Uh, welcome all to our uh, online seminar on human rights and climate change. My name is Asterius Tumanis. I represent the Transdisciplinary Institute for Environmental and Social Sciences, which is based in Thessaloniki and organizes this seminar. Um, we are also live on uh, YouTube uh, on, on uh, our platform, uh, Human Rights uh, and the Environment in the EU, and also via Zoom. Uh, I'll briefly introduce uh, um, our project and then um, move on with the presentations for our theme today. So this is the fourth uh, virtual seminar we are holding under our um, project, which is called Human Rights and the Environment in the EU Towards an Inclusive Debate. This is a, um, this is a Jean Monnet program under the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. And uh, it's a three year project that started two and a half years ago. So this is uh, our fourth uh, virtual seminar and the last virtual one. Uh, it's uh, structured thematically, as you can see. The first one was an introductory seminar. The second one focused on uh, biodiversity and human rights. The third one uh, addressed uh, intergenerational rights, including children rights. And then uh, today we will deal with uh, climate change, which is um, a quite hot topic nowadays, metaphorically and uh, practically speaking. The last seminar, Challenges in Practice, will be uh, held uh, with physical presence in Thessaloniki and will deal, among other issues, with environmental defenders. So today we have two very interesting presentations. So the first one uh, will be by Chris Spence. Um, Chris Pence is a colleague uh, um, that um, I have lots of respect for, and he will um, he will be with us today presenting two interviews. Chris has been an advisor and consultant for climate change on various organizations, including the International Institute for Sustainable Development, the European Capacity Building Initiative, and the Oxford Policy Group. He has also held leadership roles in various non-governmental organizations in San Francisco and in uh, New York. And he has also published a variety of books, including uh, literature. He also has uh, excessively written on climate change, uh, um, including a book on climate change. He will be presenting today two interviews uh, with uh, two professors. Uh, uh, the introductory part is being dealt with in the interviews, but I will give the floor to Chris briefly to talk us a little bit about uh, the interviews and the content. Up to you, Chris. Thank you, Asterios. Thank you and uh, and hello everybody. Um, so yes, as Asterius says, I uh, worked on climate change for for a long time, particularly the international uh, negotiations under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which uh, I'm I'm admitting my age a little bit here, but I began uh, following the climate negotiations at COP4 in Buenos Aires in 1998. So I've been around the block a few times in this area. Um, and uh, I recently uh, interviewed two experts on climate change and human rights, uh, Professor Sally Mol Huck and Professor Annalisa Sabaresi. And, and what you'll hear from these interviews is uh, essentially how climate change is affecting and undermining decades of efforts to enhance our human rights. And they'll talk not just about the legal aspects, um, but what is really a, a quickly moving field in terms of policy and actions at all levels from the international all the way through to the local to protect people's humans right, human rights as set out under the UN Declaration uh, on Human Rights. And it's worth adding just, just uh, one, one additional note before you watch these the two interviews that I did recently. The one recent very positive outcome was the UN General Assembly's endorsement uh, almost exactly a year ago uh, of a motion on the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And that obviously has major implications for in terms of climate change and, and its rapidly growing impact. So um, with that, I would uh, turn it back to Asterios and, and, uh, and uh, the, the interviews that we recently conducted. Thank you. Uh, be hearing the... Thank you so much, Chris. Yeah, I unmuted. So we'll now hear the interviews and uh, I will um, then uh, have you back and uh, maybe discuss a little bit on the content 
Um, and yeah, see you in a bit. Thank you. And we will move on with the interviews. First one with Annalisa Savaris. Annalisa Savaresi, you are an Associate Professor of International Environmental Law at the Center for Climate Change, Energy and Environmental Law at the University of Eastern Finland, UEF. Um, and you serve as Director for the Joint Nordic Master Program in Environmental Law. Um, you also hold a Senior Research uh, Post at the University of Stirling in the UK and visiting professorships at the University of Bologna in Italy and the University of La Sabana in Colombia. And you're an expert in environmental law with 20 years experience. And you've also written extensively on the relationship between human rights and climate change law. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. Very, very, very good and very impressive. So we'll, we'll jump uh, straight into um, some of the a few questions that I had about this kind of connection between climate change and human rights. So first off, I was just wondering if you might give us a little bit of context about the history of human rights and how they connect uh, to climate change. So um, human rights have clearly a very long history and um, they have been around since World War II really as a legal framework uh, that is aimed to protect some basic fundamental tenets of what we consider modern civilized life, um, such as the right to life, uh, freedom of expression, and so on. Um, these rights are enshrined in international treaties as well as UN declarations and have evolved over time in a very complex and stratified manner. So besides the fundamental rights that I've mentioned, we have newer generations, human rights, like uh, the right to a healthy environment that was recently recognized by the UN General Assembly, as well as the Human Rights Council. Now, uh, these rights are clearly relevant from the perspective of climate change. Yet, you may be surprised to hear that it was not until in 2009, really, but this conversation started to really be institutionalized. The Human Rights Council has since 2009 adopted a series of resolutions on human rights and climate change. And the issue of human rights has been progressively being discussed at the climate negotiations as well. Why is that? Well, the, clearly, climate change is a um, gonna affect the enjoyment of virtually all human rights. Um, the right to food, the right to water, the right to life even, uh, the right to enjoy your home and family life. So it's not a surprise that climate change is regarded as a human rights issue. At the same time, uh, the less explored but equally important aspect of this relationship is the importance of considering human rights when you are developing measures to respond to climate change, both in terms of mitigation and adaptation. So, you know, the rights of indigenous peoples um, is the most obvious that comes to mind. Indigenous peoples all over the world have been faced with challenges associated with the creation of wind farms or um, logging uh, concessions and the creation of um forest carbon offsets on their lands all of these issues are very important from a climate perspective but there is human rights implications to these projects and measures that need to be taken into account so it's not a surprise therefore that we today have uh, a special mandate holder by the human rights committee uh, on human rights and climate change and this is no less than uh, Stephen Fry, uh, sorry, uh, Ian Fry, um, Ian Fry, who is uh, well known to many veterans of the climate negotiations because himself has been a climate negotiator for a number of small um, island states. Um, at the same time, the Paris Agreement itself became the first climate treaty to recognize the matter of human rights. 
Um, it does so in a half-hearted way, and uh, for those who were following the negotiations at that time, including myself, um, it was a very uh, veritable roller coaster to witness the evolution of the text on the um, relationship between human rights and climate change in the Paris Agreement. Nevertheless, it's fair to say that it is there. It is in the preamble, therefore it doesn't entail new obligations on states, but it does, however, recognize a fact of life, which is that um, states should, when they take climate action, take into account their own human rights obligations and vice versa. And this is an important premise upon which the climate regime uh, should develop. Um, now, it's, it's a very short story that I'm giving you here, but I think it is a, an important story and gives you a perspective of how the matter of human rights and climate change has rapidly become institutionalized uh, in the processes and in the work both of the climate treaties and of the human rights bodies that are overseen by the UN. Yeah, that's so, so, and I, I guess what I'm hearing is that it has become, it has become important and recognized in the international, uh, in the international arena, both, you know, at the UN more broadly, but also with this recent recognition by the UN General Assembly of um, the right to a healthy environment, um, and also through the UN climate change process, UNFCCC, uh, through the Paris Agreement, and more recently, and I guess, I guess as climate change becomes um, more pronounced and worse, essentially, then the need for these rights to be enforced and enshrined only strengthens. Um, one thing I'm curious about is whether you could um, uh, tell us a little bit about the, the the response to this issue in a regional context. So, looking in within Europe, um, how's that? How has that developed? Has that come through the European Commission or European Union, other other regional bodies, or how's that? Work? So or even, you know, this is an interesting one because the European Union um, has, um, in many ways, addressed this issue indirectly. Um, there have been, for example, debates in the European Parliament which have contributed where the issue of so-called climate refugees was being discussed. Um, this is a very relevant conversation to be had in Europe, given the so-called migrant crisis and all the debate concerning what the European Union should be doing about that problem. This is clearly not only about climate refugees, so to say, but it's encompassing this group as well. Yeah. Um, the European Union has its own human rights instruments. Um, these instruments don't specifically mention something like the right to a stable climate. Uh, this is something that uh, UN Special Rapporteur David Boyd has elaborated in his interpretation of states' obligations in this area. So we're not quite there yet. It's fair to say, however, that um, the issue of climate justice and all the related concerns is being debated. Is there any instrument specifically about this in Europe to date? No. Um, however, it's fair to say that um, the human rights bodies in the region, the European Convention being one of them, are being asked questions increasingly about this specific matter. You probably know that the European Court of Human Rights has before itself presently a number of cases that concern climate change specifically. These have been brought by a variety of plaintiffs, um, a group of children, but also a group of elderly women, a disabled person. Um, they are all lamenting similar issues, i.e. the fact that states, including member states of the European Union, are not doing enough in order to address the climate emergency and, as such, violating their human rights in many different ways. We don't know what the outcome of these cases might be. Uh, for sure, there's a lot of pressure on the court to take a progressive stance on this subject matter. The European Court of Human Rights has a long history in dealing with this kind of environmental complaints from a human rights perspective. 
Uh, it's fair to describe the approach of the court as cautious, um, not radical, yet uh, the court has been very influential in developing a jurisprudence across the member states of the Council of Europe that has brought forward positive change across the membership of the Council of Europe. So we shouldn't discard the court as a conservative institution that is not going to be helpful. But it really depends on how willing the court will be to be progressive on this. There is encouraging signs coming from some domestic courts in some member states, like the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany. The courts in these countries have already adopted decisions that are supportive of climate applicants and base their reasoning on human rights. So this is a very important development that um, may well influence the thinking of the European Court of Human Rights as it attends to the cases that are before it. Uh, after all, normally the court is sensitive to the formation of any consensus amongst member states. And I do not know if we are quite there yet, but sure, this will be a factor that the court will consider. Yeah, you need a second? Let me get that. <laughs> sure. Sorry, otherwise there would be a buzzing noise bothering us. <laughs> No problem. But so so you were saying, basically, I think what I'm hearing is that there's been that it's certainly being addressed at the regional level, um, but that um, there is also plenty of action occurring domestically in individual nation states. And that this may actually have, if a consensus emerges, begins to emerge kind of almost a bottom up approach um, that could could have a wider regional impact. Um, the next thing I wanted to ask about was uh, just maybe just to learn a little bit about your your work and involvement in this area. What what kind of uh, projects have you been involved with in the past? What are you working on? Uh, maybe what, what are you working on now? So I've for a very long time worked on the interplay between human rights and environmental law. This is how I actually started as an environmental lawyer. I even wrote my master's thesis on this. Right. Uh, but. Um, I've collaborated with organizations such as IUCN in the past, when IUCN was in itself uh, in the process of developing something that was called a rights-based approach to conservation. We're talking about the early 2000s. Uh, from there, I've worked with a number of organizations like IAV um, that were working on similar related issues. Um, more recently, however, uh, it was very natural for me to take an interest in the climate specific aspect of the interplay between human rights and the uh, environment because um, I have worked for IASD, uh, I follow the climate negotiations first as part of my PhD and then as part of my postdoc and I was uh, reporting on the making of the Paris Agreement. I was uh, also talking a lot to those countries that were supporting the language on human rights. And of course, with the then UN Special Rapporteur John Knox, who was very involved in the making of that uh, leap in the text that uh, saw the inclusion of the language on human rights and climate change in Paris Agreement. Ever since I have, of course, written literature on this topic, I have also collaborated with some NGOs, um, including Amnesty International. I curated the content of a book on human rights and climate change. I've also worked, um, especially in Asia, in capacity building um, for judges and uh, stakeholders really on human rights and climate change and have also provided some support in the context of the first inquiry that was ever launched on the human rights and responsibilities of the so-called carbon mayors. Um, right. So this is in a nutshell 
the things I've been doing in this area, and it's fair to say that it's a very vibrant area, but there's loads of things happening. And at the regional level, this is, of course, um, ending up in legislative developments that are under consideration by the European Parliament right now um, and by the European lawmakers in general. Uh, we are talking about you know, due diligence obligations of corporations. We are talking about um, external impacts of climate action in a way that has never uh, been discussed before. So I think that um, there is a genuine shift in the thinking on these matters that is associated with uh, this greater awareness and realization that there is a lot to be done on this front. Um, and it's daunting in many ways because there is so much that needs to happen still in terms of the formulation and the implementation of climate law and policy. But at the same time, it's fair to say that um, disregarding the human rights aspects of climate action is not really an option. Um, we have plenty evidence already that doing so is a very detrimental and in fact counterproductive. Okay, great point. That, that leads me on to my last question, which is, you know, you talked about a very active, you know, things are very active right now. There's a lot of uh, thinking is changing. There's a lot of action at multi multiple levels. Um, what next? So there's a lot that needs to occur, but what would you, what would you like to see happen next? Uh, in the next, I don't know, twelve to twelve months to, to two years, uh, in, if we are to kind of really begin to safeguard people's human rights in the context of climate change in the future. I think that I want to strike an optimistic note and say that some things that need to happen are in some way happening. We have finally some financial instrument, some financial and mechanism on loss and damage. This is such a huge opportunity, belated, but important opportunity to really fill in the gaps in the climate governance system concerning support uh, on loss and damage. This is only one part of the story, of course, but it's an important part of the story. A lot more needs to happen in relation to loss and damage and climate refugees. We use this shorthand that I don't particularly like, but everybody understands what we mean when we talk about climate refugees, which is one of the most enormous gaps in the international climate governance system today. And human rights has a, a role to play there. States have obligations already that they should really abide to and implement and enforce properly um, some decisions like TTOTA and um, the more recent decision on the Torres Islanders complaint before the Human Rights uh, Committee are milestones. But this is just the beginning of a long story where I'm sure human rights will be more and more invoked and involved in the consideration of those that are tragically affected by the impacts of climate change and need to be helped and supported to cope. Uh, this is a very important yeah, aspect. The other important yeah. aspect I would like to flag is the yeah. guidance yeah. that uh, Special Rapporteur Fry is developing um, in relation to climate change response measures. I think that, um, sadly, in the past at least, there has been an oversimplification of the social impacts of climate action. So we need to be much more robust in addressing the concerns that have arisen as a result of the implementation of a number of measures like Red Plus, but also, you know, um, wind farm uh, and other renewable energy projects. Uh, we just need to be very open eyed about the implications of these developments. The Business and Human Rights Center has done an excellent job in collecting evidence of human rights abuses perpetrated by renewable energy companies. And this is not, you know, to be negative, we definitely want renewable energy, but we want to do it well and right and not in the same way 
as we've done in the past with fossil fuels uh, generation and so extraction and um, replicate all the problems that we have experienced with that energy model. We really want to move forward in a better and more positive way for everyone involved uh, and not having some communities um, suffer as a result of the transition to a carbon neutral world, which is what we all want. Yeah, that's very well put. Any last, um, well, those are my, those were the questions that I had for you and I, I like the way you've you've um, set out what we need to do <laughs> moving forward in some cases with some urgency, I think. Um, any last words or any any final thoughts you'd like to leave uh, leave with? No, I'm just very excited that you're looking at this topic. I think it's a very interesting one and there is a lot of um, civil society enthusiasm around this topic. There is also, I would say, uh, a little bit of overload uh, in the sense that it's very hard for civil society to meaningfully engage in all these conversations. And uh, we see it even in Europe where there is a lot of resources. So I can imagine how hard it is elsewhere. And when we were doing um, a report on climate change and human rights in Asia, it was really difficult to find, um, you know, experts and people engaging with the topic because there's so much uh, happening yeah. but there is not enough resources in the system yet so hopefully this conversation will continue and deliver fruits that are helpful to everyone but yeah. uh, it's a it's a long game i yeah. i am completely aware of it uh Thank you so much. So that was the first interview. Uh, I will. Uh, we will move on with the second. I will just uh, remind uh, everyone to have their uh, microphones muted for 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 the time being. Uh, and we will now move on to the second interview with Professor Salim Cook. Just get started. So, Salim al Haq, you are a, a Bangladeshi British scientist. You're an expert in the field of climate change, environment, and development. Um, you've been the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development, uh, based in Bangladesh, also a professor at Independent University in Bangladesh, as well as a lead author and contributor for a number of IPCC's uh, assessment reports. You're a senior fellow at the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED, in the UK, and a senior advisor at the Global Centre on Adaptation. And you've received a number of awards over the years, um, most recently uh, an OBE from the UK Government for Services to Combating Climate Change, which is very impressive. Have I, have I, got, have I missed anything? <laughs> that, that sounds fine. <laughs> <laughs> right, terrific. So, just jumping straight in, then, um, could you explain uh, a little uh, why or how climate change affects human rights, particularly for developing countries? I think the issue of human rights and climate change are actually very intimately interlinked. Uh, for a long time, this was not recognized, but it is now increasingly recognized. And the way in which it, it, it uh, is interlinked very simply is impacts of climate change are caused by the emissions of rich people, mostly living in rich countries, but those impacts are being felt and the victims are poor people, mostly living in poor countries. And that's not right. That's not just, uh, you know, a human rights violation. It's, it's an injustice, a manifest injustice. And increasingly, this is now being recognized, including by the, uh, the Pope himself in his Laudato Si. He has made this very clear that it is not morally correct 
and he has enjoined Catholics around the world to take actions individually as moral actions, that this is a immoral action that we must oppose. Similarly, other faiths have done this. The Muslim clergy, we don't have a, a pope equivalent in Islam, but we have uh, uh, higher authorities who have come together and they have made a similar statement saying that as Muslims, we must abide by the teachings of the Quran, which says we must not harm our fellow human beings. And in, in fact, we must help those who are poor and who are suffering. And so this is really a moral question for every individual, whether they are religious or not religious, of not accepting this unjust situation. And it is a violation of the human rights of the poorest people on the planet by the richest people on the planet. And that just can't be allowed. Yeah, well, that, which leads me to the to my next question, which is, you know, as you observed, um, a lot of the a lot of the, the wealth is currently uh, in the global north. Um, and how would you like to see how would you like to see these countries in these regions respond to these challenges? And what should they be doing to help not just themselves, but to help the the, the rest of the world? So I I'd, I'd make two um, separate. Um, cases for who needs to help whom. The the one that is most um, talked about is the North versus the South. So the global North versus global South, the global North causing the problem, global South suffering the consequences, and therefore the global North owes it to the global South. That is actually not uh, disputed. The global North accepts they have a responsibility. They've promised to give money. They're not delivering on that promise, but they are acknowledging their uh, obligation and they uh, uh, are promising to give money. But there is another divide that is less talked about, which is within countries. And every country in the world, not just poor countries, but rich countries as well, countries like in Europe or in uh, America, when the impacts of climate change happen at the country level, and they're happening now every single day, every week, the impacts fall mostly on the poorest people in those countries. And to give you a very stark example, when Hurricane Katrina hit the city of New, Orle New Orleans a number of years ago, more than a thousand people lost their lives. Every single one of them was a poor black citizen of the ninth ward of New Orleans. Not one white better off person in New Orleans lost their life, all right? And that is the level of the injustice that is taking place. It's inside countries as well as globally. And it needs to be tackled at both these scales. And in the case of Europe, the same thing applies. The people who suffer are the poorest people and the people who make decisions are the rich people and they are making decisions that are causing their own poor citizens to suffer. That's not right. And can you, could you talk, so could you tell us a little bit about your work and your involvement in this area? You have not, you and I have known one another for, for many years and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm familiar with, uh, with, with some of what you've done, um, certainly in the, in the context of the UN climate talks, but I'd love it if you could maybe just tell us, tell, um, tell uh, folks watching this uh, kind of, uh, you know, what, what, what you've been working on in Bangladesh, internationally and, uh, you know, elsewhere. Sure. So I'll, I'll describe uh, three quite different but related hats that I wear on different occasions, right? Mm -hmm. I'll start with my scientific hat, uh, which you alluded to in the introduction. I have been a lead author and a coordinating lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the third assessment report, the fourth assessment report, and then the fifth assessment report. So for many years, not the latest six assessment report. Um, and in that capacity, I've been writing a lot of the scientific uh, literature, particularly when it comes to adaptation to climate change, impacts on poor countries and how they can adapt. So that's like my scientific uh, level of expertise, as it were, adaptation to climate change, particularly in poor countries, but now even in rich countries, everybody's going to have to adapt. Uh, my second hat is at the global negotiations every year, uh, where you and I uh, quite frequently meet. Uh, 
at the annual conference of parties under the UN Framework Convention. I am one of the few people who's actually attended every single one of the wow. 27 COPs that have been held so far. And I hasten to add, though, that I don't go as a negotiator. I go as a observer, uh, as a researcher, as a professor. Uh, but I do have a role in the negotiations as an advisor to the group of least developed countries who are 46 of the poorest, most vulnerable countries. They're a formal caucus group uh, currently chaired by Senegal. And I've been advising them for many, many years on the topics of adaptation, on climate finance, and now increasingly on the emerging topic of loss and damage and how to deal with it. But that's only two weeks out of the year, uh, every year. The, the, the remaining 50 weeks of the year, I'm based in Dhaka in Bangladesh, where I'm a professor in a university called the Independent University. I run a research center there called the International Center for Climate Change and Development. We have a master's program for climate change and development. We do a lot of uh, teaching short courses for uh, people from all over the world, particularly from the least developed countries. So I will call that my third hat as my most important hat, where I actually work in country with vulnerable communities, trying to find ways to support them and enable them to be better able to cope with the impacts of climate change, which unfortunately are now already happening. And as I said earlier, it's a violation of their human rights, uh, which we need to take into account and uh, bring into that uh, diagnosis and uh, discussion. That's uh, very impressive. And, and just staying on Bangladesh for a moment, my understanding is that that uh, that in part due to your your leadership and, and other folks in, in the country who, are, who have taken this issue very seriously for a long time, that Bangladesh is, has modeled and charted a path that, that many others are looking at. Um, uh, could you tell us maybe a little bit about that? Sure. So Bangladesh is uh, recognized globally as one of the most vulnerable countries to the impacts of climate change. And that's because we have a very large population, about 170 million people, it's the eighth largest country by population in the world. But we live in a very tiny part of the world. The area of the country is less than 150,000 square kilometers which is roughly the area of Wales in the UK. Um, and the top population density is well over a thousand per person, which you only find in big cities like uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, but in Bangladesh, it's yeah. the whole country. Um, and it's a very poor, poor population, relatively poor population, getting better, but still quite poor. And uh, the geography is such that we live on the the delta of two of the biggest rivers in the world, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, which regularly flood. And we also suffer from cyclones that come from the Bay of Bengal to the coastal zone. So we are extremely vulnerable geographically uh, to the impacts of climate change, particularly cyclones and floods. Um, and because our people are, are relatively poor, the capacity to adapt is relatively low. Having said that, though, I would say that that is really the old story of Bangladesh. The new story of Bangladesh is that we have been taking climate change more seriously than any other country in the world, with the exception of the small islands who, for whom it's an existential threat. But for us, it's not an existential threat, but it is a massive threat. And so our country, from the prime minister to the finance minister, to the environment minister, to government agencies and non-government organizations and academic and researchers like myself, we have all been galvanized for at least a decade or more. And we are now moving forward in taking climate change with the seriousness that it deserves, which no other country is doing, by the way. <laughs> they, they are going to have to do it tomorrow. We're doing it today. And mm -hmm. as such, we are learning how to adapt. Uh, and in particular, the focus is on what we call locally led adaptation, which means working with the most vulnerable communities and enabling them to be better prepared rather than the opposite, which is top down adaptation where, you know, government and international agencies come and say, this is what you need to do and then tell us what to do. 
and half the time it doesn't work. And so, you know, there's this dichotomy between top down and bottom up adaptation efforts where we belong to the bottom up uh, uh, constituency saying that that is a better way to do. It's slower. It takes more time. But it is a better way to get the results that you need, which is making everybody resilient to the impacts of climate change. And that is really the pathway that Bangladesh is. We call our story yesterday's story being the most vulnerable country, today's story be being becoming the most resilient, and tomorrow is to become prosperous despite having the impacts of climate change. That's our aspiration. Brilliant. That is, and that's it's not only aspirational, but inspirational as well. So thank you for that. So so you're talking about, um, which kind of leads on to my last question, looking ahead and what, what you, your kind of vision for the future. Could we talk, maybe just, um, could you share kind of what you would, and we also spoke a little bit about what's happening internationally with the UN. You know, there's the loss and damage fund, which is supposed to be operationalized uh, this December at the next COP. Um, maybe I, I, I'd love to hear kind of what you would like to see happen next at the international level um, in terms of decisions made, in terms of actions that folks are committing to, maybe looking up to the next, this coming COP and then the following one in terms of kind of what you would like to see happen next to really kind of get us on track and, 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 and uh, help us achieve what we need to do. Great. So I've, I've been arguing now for some months that this year, 2023, is actually the first year of the new era of impacts of climate change happening. No longer something that's going to happen that we anticipate. It's already happening. And as it happens in the last few days, we had the hottest temperature ever in the whole world on the 3rd of July. And then on the 4th of July, that record got broken. And then on the 6th of July, that record got broken. So the, the first week of July is the hottest week ever in the history of the world. And that is the crossover of the threshold into global impacts of climate change happening now. Every single day, every week, every month, every year from now on, it's going to get worse, not better, worse. We can prevent the really bad things happening in the long term by reducing our emissions as we're supposed to do and promise to do. But in the near term, we can just adapt and be prepared for dealing with the losses and damages. And so what we now, what we used to call adaptation is effectively now minimizing loss and damage. And then when loss and damage happens, then we have to deal with it. We call that addressing loss and damage. So the nexus is in adapting to minimize it, but then dealing with it once it happens. And uh, as we move forward to COP28 in Dubai, uh, where we have, we had a good decision last year in COP27 to create a new fund for loss and damage. We hope that that fund will be uh, up and coming and, and uh, um, start in, in Dubai and COP28 and go forward. But more importantly than that, I, I feel that the global leaders who will be coming to Dubai in December for COP28 need to have a very different frame of mind. They should not be thinking that they're coming to the 28th conference of parties of you know a 30 year old long uh, program and it's just business as usual. They are actually coming to the first conference of parties in the new era of impacts happening and causing losses and damages. And that has a very strong human rights effect because, as I said, it's a problem caused by rich people everywhere, including rich people in poor countries like mine, but rich people in rich countries by and large. And the sufferers are poor people, mostly in poor countries, but even poor people in rich countries, including in Europe, are the sufferers. So. You know, whether you're a, a leader of your own country, you need to take that into account. And if you're a global leader coming to a global meeting, you need to take that into account. And so far, unfortunately, the leaders simply have not uh, got the message of how severe this problem is and is going to be. They'll get the message because the, the climate will give them the message, but talking to them has not given them the message. Well, we can uh, certainly hope that we get uh, get a strong outcome in at COP28 and uh, and the global stock take, which is also occurring there. Hopefully, we'll get we'll get something uh, 
concrete from that. I know that's another another major goal. But thank you very much. Was there any any last words you'd like to uh, offer? Any other any other final thoughts or? Yes. So let me add one final thought uh, in terms of taking this issue forward. Um, I've emphasized the role of leaders coming to the annual conference of parties and not doing enough, promising to do things, but then not doing them. I think we need to do a much better uh, um, galvanization of global citizens, particularly young citizens across the world. Uh, I feel that that is really where the energy and the impetus for making a change uh, lies and will come from. They're already active all over the world in every country. They're connecting with each other globally. We just have to in enable them to become much, much, much more uh, useful and powerful and making the changes that are needed and insisting that the their own leaders make the changes that need to be done. So I am now investing a lot of my effort with younger people and I'm very happy to engage with any young people who want to get in touch with me to see how we can uh, make sure that they become a force to be reckoned with, not just advocacy, but a force. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Selim. All right. So thank you, Chris, so much for these interviews. They were uh, particularly interesting, and I think they were also well linked. Um, do you have any uh, wrap-up thoughts or uh, remarks on, on the interview you just uh, watched? Yeah, thanks, Asteris. Yeah, I mean, I think both both of them were very eloquent, and it was it was very interesting chatting with both of them. And I just I just wanted to kind of reflect on a couple of key takeaways I had from these two uh, interviews. One was, and I, I which I heard from both Salim and Annalisa was that this is a really fast moving field of work and activity. Um, there is a long game involved, but it, things are moving quite quickly. Um, and led in some ways, as Salim pointed out, by the necessity, uh, by necessity, because climate change is, is already having such a dramatic and profound impact, and that seems to be accelerating. Um, another takeaway I had from the two interviews was that these actions aren't just occurring at any one particular level. I mean, there are clearly international efforts um, where people are grappling with this, but it's also being um, thought through and acted on very carefully at regional, national, and local levels. And in some ways, we're seeing quite a bottom-up uh, approach to this, as well as people looking at this globally. And in, for instance, Salim's case, doing, <laughs> doing both, um, both uh, working internationally and, and, uh, and domestically and nationally. Then the, I guess the other um, uh, thought that I'd like to share is um, to draw attention, which Annalisa referred to uh, briefly, was the recent appointment in 2022 of a UN Special Rapporteur on Climate Change and Human Rights, Ian Fry. And uh, I was in touch with Dr. Fry recently, um, I've known him for many years. He, he's gone on record with his belief that there is a really... Uh, quite serious debt, what he calls a deficit in legal protection, especially, um, and he was is very focused on the, this idea of uh, people who are being displaced by climate change impacts, which seems like some, something that is only going to get worse as climate change uh, continues to accelerate. Now, he's been advocating very strongly for the creation of a loss and damage fund uh, which is something that both Annalisa and Salim uh, referred to in passing, which is this, this idea of um, compensating or or, or uh, supporting uh, countries and groups that have been affected by um, by climate impacts. Um, now, this idea of a loss and damage fund was agreed in principle at COP27 in Egypt um, in December, uh, uh, sorry, last November. But the idea is that it will be fully operationalized and the details will be fully fleshed out at COP28, which is occurring this December in Dubai. So it's, it'll be worth watching that process to see if that happens successfully, because a, a lot of folks, are particularly negotiators from the Global South, are very keen to see that um, loss and damage fund actually begin to operate and disperse uh, funding. Um, the other thing that Dr. Fry has also recommended is, is an optional protocol and a, essentially an additional legal agreement to the UN's Framework Convention on Climate Change, 
And that new protocol would be focused um, on the status of refugees with the idea of protecting the rights of people who are displaced across international borders um, due to climate change. So it will be interesting again to see if this idea gains traction um, internationally. So those would just be the other the other kind of points that I would add on to those those two very interesting interviews. Yes, and uh, from what you say, um, I can, uh, and also from the interviews, combining a little bit with two of them, um, there is there is there is a lot of um, low, let's say, low production, a lot of legal cases, especially in in Europe, currently going on on climate change and violations of uh, of human rights. Uh, Annalisa reflected on this a bit. Um, we have also the let's say social element that Professor Hook was alluding to. Uh, speaking about youth action or you know mobilizing change through youth action, where do you see the balance line between the two of these two? I mean, on one on one hand, uh, filling the legal gaps to afford the necessary protection, especially to the most vulnerable, and on the other hand, the political process either grassroots or through the UNFCCC. Or how how do you see this balance line? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, my feeling is that the, the two are, are, are reinforcing so that, you know, climate activism and the involvement of, of kind of youth and other climate groups um, will help uh, move the political process. But um, uh, at the legal level, um, I, I, that will also have an impact, uh, you know, both uh, nationally and regionally. And I know Annalisa's done some work uh, with a colleague, Joanna Setzer, looking at um, existing climate cases. Apparently, so this, as of last year, there were more than a hundred um, climate cases that, that had been brought to, to various courts that are using uh, human rights arguments to promote action on climate change. And also there, there seems to be a growing movement to this, the discussions around kind of just transition cases that are questioning kind of the distribution of benefits and, and impacts that the drive to net zero is creating. So that's, an, that, that's an, 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 a whole other area that's kind of developing. And my, my sense in that area is that we really need to, we're kind of entering a whole new frontier of litigation and that we probably, it, it probably requires more research and understanding to, to really figure out where this very fast moving um, kind of field is, is going right now. Yeah, thank you for your answer. And the last question, um, Professor Hook was using very much the, uh, let's say, uh, element of uh, powerful people making decisions, taking decisions, rich people taking decisions on behalf of vulnerable people, of poor people, both uh, in the North-South divide and internally in, in countries, uh, the inequalities there. Uh, I guess the question, the question is, uh, uh, during the UN negotiations under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change that you, you, you've been following since COP4, as you said, so it's quite a long time. Do you see this divide in the negotiation? Do you see that the, indeed uh, more wealthy, more powerful countries are the ones that uh, affect the decision taking more than uh, vulnerable, vulnerable groups or due to the UN culture, it's more balanced? That's a, that's a really good question. I mean, I, you know, I, the UN process is one where all countries have to agree. You know, they, they, um, there is no voting mechanism that has been agreed under their rules of procedure. So, you know, almost 200 countries have to sign off on things. That therefore does give all, all uh, delegations, uh, at least uh, notionally, an equal, equal impact. Um, but I, I think, you know, my sense and read on it is that the reality is that countries that have more resources, that have more delegates in attendance, um, you know, typically can have an outsized impact. Uh, and then as for, as for other groups trying to influence the process, um, I think, you know, particularly we see this in, in Europe and in North America, uh, where, um, uh, uh, where politicians are, you know, looking at at their voters and who might elect them in the next the next go round, where where we see um, where we see a public uh, that is highly motivated on climate change and that will will vote uh, 
uh, there are politicians in or out on that basis. I think we're beginning to see that having a significant impact. Um, we're beginning to see that that has an impact because uh, the, the, that uh, concern that politicians may have that if they're seen as being too, especially especially in, in certain countries where the, the public has really moved very far on climate change, those politicians want to make sure they're moving with the population so they don't get voted out, out of office. And I think that that is certainly having an impact on negotiating positions uh, in certain delegations. So again, it's a moving to say that they, they, even at the, U, you know, the UN negotiations, it's a kind of moving uh, target in terms of how things are, how things work. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So it was really, really interesting. Thank you, Chris, so much uh, for, for doing this and for having you in the seminar today. Also, thank you for accommodating our time schedule. Uh, New Zealand is not the easiest uh, of the time zones. Uh, they always get the hard bargain in uh, virtual <laughs> settings. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, actually, this uh, gives us uh, the opportunity to move uh, this discussion on the COP uh, gives us the opportunity to move and the decision taking give us the opportunity to move to the second part of your presentation. So I will say goodbye to you now. Thank you so much say once more and um, let's move on to the second part. Thank you. Um, Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So for the second part, we'll have we'll have with us uh, Chiara Ward, who will uh, present on um, uh, the power dynamics. So Chiara is a political scientist uh, with a particular interest in how power dynamics influence decision taking, and that's that's come quite handy after the decision, the discussion we just had uh, with Chris. She has also followed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change for quite a while now, and she will uh, use her photography and uh, storytelling skills to tell us a little bit more about uh, how decisions are being taken, what are the factors that influence them, and how can we affect decision-making moving forward in the future. So hello, Chiara. Nice to have you with us. Hi, thanks. <laughs> thanks so much for having me. And yeah, nice to see you, Chris, and great, great couple of interviews beforehand. So thanks for, for the good setup. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start if that's if that's good. Let me just find my. OK, so today, as as Asterio said, I have been covering the climate negotiations um, as a photographer, documentary photographer uh, for just under a decade. And so I've had this really amazing opportunity to witness and to reflect on the different deliberations that have taken place. And in addition, I'm a I'm a student of power and politics. It was the main focus of my Ph.D. research. And so I'm really thrilled to be able to, to bring two of these different worlds together and to share with you some of the ideas around climate change, human rights, and power. So I'm going to just dive right in. Um, as we all know, and as the previous speakers have said, the world as it stands is really on fire. You know, we since the adoption of the Paris Agreement, we have this global ambition to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. But the reality is that we are solidly on track for about a 2.6 degree increase. And the latest reports from the WHO and the IPCC say that we will actually temporarily reach a 1.5 degree threshold within the next few years. So the projections for the future um, are not just bleak, but as we've been discussing, they're actually happening right now. And so the impact that climate change is having on human rights is really occurring on a daily basis almost. And so what are some of those impacts that we're seeing? And, we, and the previous speakers discussed these quite a bit, but I, I think it might be nice to put a bit of a visual um, to those thoughts so that we really see what we're talking about. So first and foremost, you know, one of the biggest impacts of climate change that we're seeing is an increase of floods, storms, and cyclones. And this is impacting human rights by damaging infrastructure, habitats, household livelihoods, movement, um, physical safety. We're also seeing sea level rise in, in low-lying areas, which is also causing damage to infrastructure, things like transport, energy systems, and also customs and cultural practices. We're seeing an increase of wildfires, which in addition to all of the impacts that it has on infrastructure and our social settings, 
has a tremendous loss or impact on biodiversity and habitat loss, which in turn has other socioeconomic impacts. Um, we're seeing huge changes in weather patterns, which is all increasing very severely agriculture and food production. And this is impacting rights by increasing hunger, increasing poverty, forcing people into unfair work and, and into moving to areas where there might be better access to resources. And of course, this, this change of weather patterns also leads to water shortages, which has implications for health and sanitation, for for achieving livelihoods, for gender discrimination, for education. And all of these impacts, of course, have a direct impact on, on human health. So not only are we suffering from things like heat stress, um, but there's also an increase of diseases. This is impacting our ability to work, to enjoy life, and it's, it's causing the loss of life. And so all of these, the combined factors of, of all of these, these impacts is really causing people to move. And so we're seeing a huge movement of migration, which in turn has impacts on safety and security, the, the loss of homes and the household structure of, of cultural traditions and stability and of people's access to justice. So overall, we see that without a doubt, um, climate change is very severely impacting human rights in a number of ways. And when we consider human rights, we can really consider them in two kind of big groups. The first is the economic, social, and cultural rights. So these include all of our things like social services, social protection, education, employment, uh, cultural practices and customs. And then we can look at our civil and our political rights. Um, so minority rights, movement, freedom of participation in society, freedom from forced labor, gender equality. And what we see with climate change is that really it is indeed impacting human rights across the board, from security to freedom to justice to safety to liberty to peace to hope. Basically, every human right that you can think of uh, is being impacted. And the other thing that we're seeing is that these impacts, as Professor Hook was saying, they're not being experienced equally, that the more devastating impacts are being felt in the global south, who are not only geographically more vulnerable, but also have less resilience and adaptive capacity to respond to these kind of these kind of impacts. And this is really particularly the case for least developed countries and small island developing states. And the more these impacts happen, it raises some really interesting and difficult questions about human rights. So small island states, for example, are, are just a really interesting case. The, the country of Tuvalu, the highest land in Tuvalu is one meter high. So if sea level rises by, let's say, even half a meter, the people of Tuvalu have to go. And so this raises these questions of where will they go? Who finances this move? Uh, what citizenship will these people have when they do move? What rights uh, will they have? And so it becomes very complex, you know, and at a global level, we're seeing it in this way. But just as Professor Hook was saying as well, the same is true at a national level, that we're seeing that climate change is impacting the most vulnerable and the least resilient within our society. And so what we have is this situation where those who did the least to create climate change are indeed the most impacted by it. And so climate change really just isn't a matter of protecting human rights. It is very deeply connected to matters of justice. Now, of course, it goes without saying that we have to take into account that climate change really is the result of centuries of historical inequalities that have been fueled by capitalism, by systemic racism, by exploitation, all of which have served to, to fuel our frenzied drive towards capitalism. And this has led to these enormous empower, power imbalances that we, that we see not only across the world, but also within the global negotiations. And so this creates a really interesting state of play within the climate negotiations that those responsible for climate change are the least impacted by it and actually the only ones with the power to change it, right? And so fundamentally, the issue of climate change comes down to a matter of power. 
Now, power is a really huge topic, and I'm, I'm not going to do it justice in this presentation today. But I wanted to explore a couple of elements of it um, just a bit briefly. So the notion that some people have more power than others is really one of the hallmark characteristics of our time. And a great parade of names from Plato to Aristotle to Machiavelli to Hobbes and Pareto and Weber, they have devoted their lives to trying to address um, this phenomena. And you can look at power in, in a number of different ways. You can look at power as production. So more in terms of forms of governance and how we can use power to collaboratively, collaboratively work together. But we can also look at power as domination, which tends to be the overriding view of power in today's society. But whether you're looking from power as production or power as domination, one of the things that we can agree on is that power is relative, and it really is the ability to influence or control the world in which we live, which is in turn largely dependent on the control of resources. Now, the literature on power is extensive, um, but I have a focus on power as domination. And, and what it tells us is that those in power typically try to use their resources to maintain the status quo. Now, why? Well, quite simply because it keeps them in power and it's a situation that makes them comfortable and happy, right? And so they use their resources to maintain the status quo, to keep them in power. And one author, Luke, Stephen Lukes, suggests that there are three dimensions of power that we can really observe and look at in order to analyze the different power dynamics that are being at play, right? And so we're gonna look at those very briefly uh, today. Now, the first dimension, and this was a theory really purported by Robert Dahl, is, is very, very basic, that, that power is seen through decision-making. So the most basic understanding of power is the ability of A to get B to do what they want them to do, right? Whether they like it or not, and they use their power and their resources to control that behavior. And in this way, Power is observed most readily over conflict and decision-making and the control of resources in that decision-making. So perhaps there's an uprising within a country and the government and power says, no, nope, we're going to exert our security force and squash that and the conflict is resolved, right? But people considered this as the first dimension of power and they thought, but power is not quite so simple. There's there's a, a much more subtler tone to power. And so authors like Barach and Baratz, um, they said that actually there's a second dimension of power that is more about agenda setting, that power is not only about who wins or loses in key decision-making issues, but rather about preventing those issues from being discussed in the first place, right? And in this way, some issues are organized into politics and others are organized out. And so power is really about determining the agenda of the struggle and mobilizing bias to support the status quo. So this, this gives us a little bit more of a satisfactory understanding of power, but Stephen Lukes went one step further and he said, indeed, we have conflict and decision-making, which we can we can observe power taking place there. And indeed, we have agenda setting and we can observe power taking place there. But there is a third and far more subtle form of power. The, the third dimension of, of power is really changing people's ideologies. And he argues that through socially structured patterns and behaviors, through the use of repetition and symbolic action, people can actually be coerced fundamentally in their thinking, which prevents issues from arising in the first place. And this is very closely linked to the Gramsian idea of cultural hegemony and how different social forces lead to the engineering of consent by really changing the way that people relate to their environment in the first place and by normalizing different power imbalances that are at play. So those are really the three dimensions of power that we can examine. And it's very interesting to apply these three dimensions of, of power to the climate negotiations and to see how those in power 
are using their power in these different ways uh, to maintain the status quo. So let's have a look. Now, if we consider first and foremost the first dimension of power, decision-making and the control of resources, uh, we can first and foremost see very clearly that there's a conflict over greenhouse gas emissions, right? So we know fundamentally that in order to stop climate change, we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And even though we've made this commitment, even those in power have made a commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, since the signing of the Paris Agreement, we've seen greenhouse gas emissions increase, save for a little, little blip in the road due to the COVID pandemic. But overall, emissions are increasing, right? So we see that those in power are using their resources to maintain the status quo. We can also see this, and Chris was kind of alluding to it in his questions now about how those in power, do they have more influence over the negotiations themselves? And I would say, yes, indeed they do. So what we see in the negotiations is that, that um, fossil fuel producing countries are doing things like simply rejecting the science, you know, and this, they're saying, well, we don't agree. We don't agree that these impacts are gonna be so bad. And, you know, is the science really so important? And no, and because they reject the science, they then hold up the process, it delays negotiations. It means that we can't respond effectively if we don't all same have the same reality. So indeed, this kind of, of behavior helps to maintain the status quo. And I think that we can actually see the first dimension of power most clearly in the refusal to meet the climate finance goals of $100 billion per year, while instead we continue to subsidize the fossil fuel industry to the tune of $700 billion per year, right? So we can see that very clearly. We have a conflict here. We have all these things that we know need to change, and those in power are very firmly, very strongly using their resources to not affect change at all, and indeed to maintain the status quo, which currently maintains their power. Now, if we look at the second dimension of power, of agenda setting, we see this even more clearly throughout the, the climate negotiations. Last year, and we've spoken a lot about it today already, um, was is this idea of loss and damage, you know? And, and we can see that there have been huge delays about addressing loss and damage in the climate negotiations. So for those that aren't aware of it, loss and damage is really the recognition that climate change impacts um, are unavoidable, that they, that they are going to cause these inevitable impacts and the collective losses and damages um, that will come from those impacts are known as loss and damage. And because exactly as Professor Hook was saying, um, that the people who are experiencing these loss and damages did nothing to create them, um, that they really believe that it's time for developed countries to pay up for the damage that they have done. So the loss and damage fund and the establishment of it is not just critical in terms of, of pursuing adaptation, but it's also a really important recognition of justice, that there is that there are social inequalities that have led to this situation. And so for years, even though loss and damage has been on the, you know, within the Paris Agreement since 2015, it's taken, you know, years and years and years just to get it on the agenda. And indeed, at COP27, we had a very positive outcome of the establishment of the loss and damage fund. But it's my personal belief that that was really only the result of the devastating impacts of the floods in Pakistan, where 33 million people were impacted. And that was really the driving force um, that put loss and damage on the agenda. And it was impossible um, for countries to refuse to address it anymore. One of the things that we also see in terms of the second phase um, of power and the mobilization of bias is this increasing concern of, of lobbying from the fossil fuel industry at the climate negotiations. So for example, at COP27, there were more than 700 fossil fuel lobbyists in attendance at the negotiations. And all of these lobbyists just happened to come over the high level segment where they could influence politicians. Mm -hmm. and, and so we see that there's a lot of debate and there's a big push in the negotiations right now for more transparency mm -hmm. over who is a fossil fuel uh, related lobbyist at the negotiations. And just as another example of agenda setting, we saw this year at the climate negotiations in Bonn that again, um, 
critical issues, critical issues like mitigation, like fundamental to addressing climate change, simply was not on the agenda, that there were blocks for what was going to be on the agenda and what was going to be discussed. And so in these different ways, we see that indeed, uh, those in power are absolutely using their resources uh, to control the agenda of, of the negotiation process to mobilize bias towards suiting their own interests. Now, looking at the third face of power and ideology, it's a lot trickier, right? Because it is harder to, to pinpoint what are these underlying beliefs and also much harder to show them in a photograph. So, so I'm just gonna offer you two thoughts um, for this. So first of all, I think that there's a, a general notion that overriding all of the climate negotiations, no matter what we're doing, that those in power still control the means of, pro of production that perpetuate our dependence on fossil fuels, you know? And so there is kind of this sense of hopelessness, certainly among civil society and among certain individuals of how much change they can affect. And we can use uh, plastic, single-use plastic as an example, you know? I can recycle uh, or separate my waste as, as much as I possibly can but that is still not going to influence the amount of plastic that is being produced. And so there's this overriding ideology that those in power still control the means of production and, and that there's nothing we can do to fight against that. And it's, it's a tough one. At the same time, there's still a huge amount of control of information, of social media, of knowledge. You know, um, a lot of the discussions that, are, that take place in the climate negotiations, they're very important, but they're very inaccessible. Um, masses of, of people struggle to relate to what is this information. And, and we're really living in an era of false news, of, of fake news and of, of disinformation. And it's hard to separate where is the truth and, and you know what, what is reliable in this day and age. And so this is all part of, of the power mechanisms that are fueling this chaos and this inaction around climate change. And lastly, I think it's important to recognize that the, that the ongoing conflicts around the world um, are really fueling a greater fundamental sense of disunity. And that in order to address climate change, we have to recognize our fundamental unity. This is, this is what addressing inequality is all about. And and instead, we see that these, these ongoing wars and conflicts around the world are even seeping into the negotiations. So we will spend time in the climate negotiations arguing over the Russia-Ukraine war instead of speaking about the issues of climate change that we need to. So all of this is, is a lot of power. And so what does, it, what does all of this tell us, right? What it tells us is that in order to effectively address climate change, we actually need to, to shape and transform the fundamental power dynamics that are at play. And that's really what I think is, is quite an exciting area or, or place to be in within the climate space. And so how do we do that? Well, first and foremost, we have people like the amazing Mia Motley, who is just one of my most favorite people in the world. And, and she is really working to build a coalition of nations that are committed to overhauling the financial systems, including the IMF and the World Bank. And she, you know, her, like many others, believe that these systems are just perpetuating a lot of the inequalities and the injustice around the world and that they need to be completely overhauled and that that finance needs to be redirected to, to build better adaptive capacity and to indeed improve access to, to people's human rights. And this is one of the things that definitely needs to be done, that we need to actually transform the global systems um, that are driving a lot of, of what shapes our actions. Secondly, I think that it's really important to focus on locally led adaptation, as was also, also discussed. And this is important for two reasons, right? First of all, climate change is happening. There's no way out of it. We might be able to indeed stop some of the longer term projections, but now it's about adaptation. And locally led adaptation really helps to shift the decision making process 
to local people. It gives them control of their own resources. It helps to increase the participation of indigenous people, women, marginalized groups, and it builds their capacity for adaptive change. And so that really is a shift in the power dynamics that, that we can see. Um, I, I also think that it's important to continue adopting a human rights approach throughout the negotiations. It is surprising um, that it's that it's taken so long for, for human rights to really be efficiently recognized within the process. Um, but there's more work to be done, you know, that we can embed human rights more deeply in the negotiations that are ongoing um, within our national policies and indeed throughout all of our development practices and implementation as we move forward um, with adaptation. And, and this covers a whole range of things. This is this touches on issues like the just transition, you know, and how we can embed human rights more in, in the activities and the transitions that we that we undertake. And last but not least, of course, we have the ability to, to adopt these principles within our own personal choices. And, and whether it's whatever decision we make, you know, whether it's the work we do or the clothes we buy or how we manage our waste or, or the products that we, that, we, that we use, you know, we have an ability to reflect on the notion of human rights and on justice and to apply that um, and to really critically think about how power dynamics exist within our own spaces um, and to work, to work towards changing those. Now, all of this is really to just, I guess, highlight that climate change is not simply an environmental issue. In fact, it's not an environmental issue at all. It's a matter of social justice and it's a matter of morality. And it really can only be addressed by shifting the fundamental power dynamics that drive it. And until we do that, um, we're really just putting band-aids on a lot of the impacts that we're going to experience. So if we do want to make a change, these are some of the critical issues um, that we need to look at. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, thanks so much for, for listening. And um, if you are interested, I, I do a lot of storytelling from the climate negotiations where I reflect on a lot of these issues, both breaking down the issues being discussed and on how they impact notions of power. Um, so feel free to follow me on Instagram for more regular updates on global negotiations. Thank you so much, Chiara. This was a fascinating uh, dive into the world of decision making and power dynamics. Um, I guess one question that stands out to me from your presentation is the one uh, when you refer to the lobbying from the fossil fuel industry, right? And uh, I mean, I need to ask the forthcoming the forthcoming COP is COP twenty eight, as I understand, is going to be. Uh, hosted by the United Arab Emirates, Emirates, correct? It's uh, one of the major oil producing countries in the world. Is there any controversy there, any, any criticism there? Or, or people think that it's the best way to have everybody on board? Well, nobody thinks it's the best way, that's for sure. Um, yes, I mean, COP28 being held in, in the UAE is surrounded by huge controversy, not not just because it's in the UAE, which is obviously a major oil producing nation, but also because the COP28 president designate is the um, the head of, of ADNOC, which is the Abu Dhabi um, national oil company. So a lot of people feel that this is a major conflict of interest. Um, there's, I, I would say that there's two arguments for and against this and I'm I'm not going to place myself on either one. I'm just going to put it out there. So one argument is that a lot of people are saying that the fossil fuel industry really controls everything at the moment. And so if we want to address climate change, the fossil fuel industry needs to be involved and they need to be on board with the negotiations. And that pretty much is true. And the UAE is arguing that this is their line. You know that that they're participating in it as a fundamental producer, that this will help them to transition um, and they have great influence over it. But of course, it's not quite so simple. Other people believe that it's, it's outrageous and that the oil and gas industry does not deserve a seat at the table at all. So it is indeed surrounded by a lot of controversy. Um, to make it even worse, there have been a number of articles coming out recently. Yesterday, an article came out in The Guardian about 
how the presidency is allegedly greenwashing a lot of their statements, that there's pages and pages and pages of talking notes um, that people will be able to say, no mention of fossil fuels. So indeed, I think uh, COP28 is going to be a very tough COP from that perspective. Um, and suitably follows COP27, which was mired by a lot of the same kind of controversy. So we will see how that plays out. Um, a lot of questions about civil participation, about the freedom that civil society will have to protest, to voice their concerns. And indeed, it will be, a, it will be something to watch for sure. Yes, indeed. And um, actually, also during uh, the discussion with Chris, we, we alluded alluded to that. Um, um, the the uh, you also mentioned the uh, loss and damage fund. Yeah, and COP twenty eight would be important in its operationalization, as far as I understand it. Um, so. Would that fund, I mean, would that fund be driving locally led adaptation that you mentioned, or are there other resources that will be used towards that direction? Or are we expect are we expecting a north generated loss and damage funding stream towards the south? Is that what we're envis envis envisaging? I think it's really hard to say at the moment where where the loss and damage fund is going. Um, they've at the moment they've set up this transitional committee to discuss all of these matters. So I don't think it's resolved, or at least I'm not privy to the information of how it will be operationalized. And I think indeed this is the big question. But I think some of the concerns that have already been coming up is you know, we haven't met our $100 billion worth of, of climate finance previously. So setting up another fund, yes, it's great. And in principle, it's good and we do need it. But if that fund is not filled, then what good will it be? So I think there's a lot of controversy over that and a lot of concern that we're just establishing another fund that perhaps people won't actually have access to, or that indeed it will be set up in a certain way that that access to these funds um, to support locally led adaptation may not be as effective. I think it's too early to say. Uh, I think this is indeed the debate of, of how, how it can be the most effective, how it should link to other um, international funds, how it will be operationalized. So... Yeah, we'll see how it goes. All right. Uh, we have a question from uh, Ivana uh, in the chat. Uh, can you please expand on the how and why the locally led adaptation help can help shift the power dynamics and protect and advance human rights? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that question as well. Um, I think. I think actually locally led adaptations is one of our is one of our greatest solutions to to the climate crisis um, because indeed it does it does really help to shift the the power dynamics at a very fundamental scale. So I think you know at the moment power is out of balance because certain people have control of resources, certain people have the ability to make decisions, and certain people dictate how life is going to be. And locally led adaptation really strives to do the opposite of that. So it gives the, the ability or the opportunity to local communities to come together, to identify their issues, to, to assess their environments, to consider what the best way forward is, to have access to resources um, that might help them do that. So I think in a number of ways, uh, locally led adaptation really does help to, it touches on the notion of local empowerment it gives people the capacity and the ability to respond more adequately. And I think that in and of itself um, helps to shift the power dynamics uh, quite sincerely. And, and what's what's wonderful about this, and I've actually worked with ICAD um, before, and I encourage everybody here, we put together a book last year sharing stories of locally led adaptation. So it was called Stories of Resilience. And we looked at these different case studies where um, there's these core principles of what makes adaptation locally led, and it includes the participation of indigenous people, of setting up financial structures, of equalized decision-making structures. 
And, and we looked at different case studies taking place around the world of how locally led adaptation is being actualized. And I think they're good stories, you know, that these are really the kind of things that very slowly, unfortunately, um, very slowly, but but really do make a shift uh, towards a more climate resilient world that we're trying to achieve. All right, thank you. And um, thanks also Ivana for the question. Uh, my last question is a dual one. You mentioned um, about um, civil society yeah, and limitations in civil society, potential limitations in civil society activities in the forthcoming COP at the UAE. Um, I guess the question is, how far do you think these actions go in terms of, effect, uh, of influencing decision making or influencing agenda setting? And then the second part of the question would be on individual choices. So people are interested in being more sustainable. What kind of choices, everyday choices, do, can they do? And is it, is, are they influenced by, by, by their, their, their social status? I mean, people with more resources can be more sustainable, you think? Or is it individual choices can be similar for all groups of the society? Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, okay, so I'll tackle the first part of that. So, so what kind of impact does civil society really have? I think I think it's a it's an interesting question because it's clear that civil society doesn't have a decision making ability within the negotiation space. So they don't have um, either the first two dimensions of power that we kind of discussed. They don't have the ability to to um to make these kind of decisions and they also don't have the ability to set the agenda but i do think that civil society plays a very important role in in ideology and that it is this overriding ideology that we need almost the most critical awareness of because it is the most uh intrinsic within us it is the deepest one and so even though civil society might not you know determine the outcome of the agenda fight I think their presence there does help to influence the the overriding ideology. And indeed, it helps to build um, global movements. It, it helps people to feel part of something, feel connected to something, which can, and I guess this leads to the second part of your question, which can help them to make more critical and better personal decisions. The decisions that we make, I think we have choices every day. It, it's Jane Goodall who said that every decision that we make um, has an impact on the world around us. So it's choices about what kind of transport do we use? Um, what clothes do we buy? What kind of waste do we incur? What levels of consumption do we have? You know, we all as individuals make um, these choices every day and we have the power to, to change those. Indeed, your social status does influence your ability to do that. The wealthier you are, the greater your variety of choices, of course, you know. Um, but I still think that there are decisions that the majority of us can make. And really, it is us who, who have power and who have access to resources that do need to make those decisions, right? So it's not the poor person down the road who's living off of a, a sweet potato and a yam once a week that's causing climate change. It's me driving my car, buying my single-use plastics, buying my clothes and contributing in all the ways that I do. So I, as a person of privilege and power, um, I do indeed have the ability uh, to make more critical choices about how I live. Um, Will that change the whole world? Of course not, you know, but again, I think it sets in motion <clears throat> this, the ideology, the third face of power, B bigger questions of who we are, where we belong, what, what ideas and, and future we want to have. That's all intrinsically part of our ideology. And so, yes, you know, even though it might not stop plastic production, I will indeed continue to make those decisions to manage my waste better because that's the ideology in the world that I want to create. So I guess we'll see if it has an impact or not, but I, I firmly do believe that it does. 
Yes, I guess we shall see, and we will be following with great interest all the developments in the climate change sphere, including climate, uh, the COP28, and uh, including the loss and damage fund and everything else um, you spoke about, and also Chris. Uh, we thank you both very much. It was a great, great, great seminar. I will uh, also, I will ask you to stay with us for a couple of more minutes in case anybody has a, a, an additional question. In the meantime, I will be saying uh, goodbye to start saying goodbyes to everyone. And we have one more uh, last seminar for the project that will take place in Thessaloniki towards the end of September, to uh, beginning of October. Uh, the date will be announced soon. And uh, we will focus on uh, a series of uh, interesting things, I would say, including uh, uh, the energy transition, including uh, challenges with uh, industrial generation of uh, solar power, of wind farms, um, and all uh, all of these topics. Also, we'll deal with environmental defenders um, and stuff like that. Um, I don't see any additional questions. Chris, would you like to add something before we leave? No, I thought I, I thought that was a terrific presentation, Kira. I don't don't have anything to to add to that. Very very good. All right. So thank you both so much. It was really great. The video will be available on YouTube for future reference by everyone. And um, thank you so much for your contributions. We'll be in touch shortly for the next stages. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much for attending. I'll